hello from uh, a blue skied virtual Grey's Westminster secondhand department. I've just been reading your comments. <laughs> you do make me laugh. <laughs> All right. Um, happy Tuesday to anyone who's forgotten what day of the week it is. I certainly have. Um, I keep reminding myself. I'm glad that everyone, so many people have made it on time, right in the nick of time. And thank you so much, David, for your contribution to the coffee fund. Um, for those of you who aren't subscribers, please do subscribe and hit the bell icon. That will tell you when I'm streaming, but it will also tell you when we upload videos. Um, when things return to normality, we will be uploading videos again, not just me blabbing on for an hour at a time about various photographic topics, but actually shorter and uh, slightly better quality in terms of filming uh, videos will return when, uh, when lockdown is finished. Um, also, please do contribute to the Coffee Fund if you want to, just by hitting the dollar sign there, or if you're not watching this live, you can do so by uh, hitting the PayPal me link that we've got at the bottom. It is all very greatly appreciated, um, as you can probably imagine. At times like this, caffeine and uh, the simple pleasures of donuts and croissants <laughs> keep us all going. Uh, today, I am talking about composition. Now, I'm not just going to talk about composition. I'm also going to talk about fisheye lenses. Um, and I did a little collaboration with a few of our regulars and also Simon Stafford, who very kindly uh, sent me over some stuff because I happen to be bereft of a fisheye in lockdown. And I thought, how am I going to talk about fisheye lenses if I don't have one with me? Um, but I do know a number of fantastic photographers who do have access to lots of fisheyes. So I will talk about that a little bit later. Um, also on Thursday, I have a very exciting stream for you planned with a collaboration, hopefully. <gasps> yes, with um, our guest, uh, Anne, or Annie as I know her, Cahill, who um, you may know is the other half of uh, Joe McNally, uh, will hopefully be preparing some stuff for us to do together on Thursday. So uh, it's gonna be very, very exciting. But today I am talking about, I'm going back to basics a little bit. Uh, we are talking about composition and the rules. Now, oh, thank you, Paul. <laughs> thank you so much for your contribution to the coffee fund. Um, that's that's a few coffees. That's coffees for all the office staff, I think. <laughs> thank you. Actually, London, it's probably like two and a half coffees. <laughs> um, so there are no real hard and fast rules when it comes to composition. There are some guides and rules, and if you know them, then you kind of know how to break them. Um, but it is good to know the basics. So I am gonna talk about those and also some of the, the guides. I've had quite a few people who've messaged me and said, thanks so much for all the technical stuff, you know, all the settings and things, um, but I don't feel like I have an artistic eye or um, how do you make a picture go from kind of just a boring picture to looking quite spectacular. Very, very interesting. Um, some of you may know the the name Jim Brandenburg. He is a phenomenal nature photographer um, and also a friend of the shop. You may also know um, our good friend Neil Lucas, who has worked on various different um, BBC programmes, in including working with David Attenborough, so David Attenborough, and also on uh, Life and Blue Planet and things like that. Um, now, funnily enough, Neil has spent quite a bit of time with Jim and they went out and they both took exactly the same photo with pretty much the same equipment and ended up with completely different results. And a lot of it has to do with composition. Also, I personally think that everything that Jim touches just turns to magic. <laughs> but, <laughs> but there are some things that you can do. Um, and Neil himself is also a phenomenal photographer, so I don't know what difference he saw, but there, there was a difference. So. Most of us know that you can, I will answer your question, Andy, later on the fish eye, don't worry. Um, I will just park it so that I, I keep my little, I've got a plan. I have three pages worth of plans, so I'm gonna try and stick to it as much as possible. Um, so when it comes to composition, we all learn the rule of thirds. I mean, that's a basic, I learned that in art class um, when I was a kid, but also when you kind of first learn photography, often the rule of thirds gets bandied about a lot. That is a very good place to start. Um, it essentially means that you take your rectangular grid or sheet or, you know, frame. Uh, let me just find the right thing that I actually want. I don't have it drawn out here, but 
is a piece of paper and you take a grid and you chop it up like that um, into squares of nine, let's say. So you've, you've done that and then you put your, your subjects or the main things that you want to take a picture of, you put them in the cross sections. Now, the problem with doing that is that it can make pictures start to look boring pretty quickly. Um, some people master it and they stick to it and that is what they use. It's very frequently used in uh, landscape photography, for example, but also portraiture. But it does get boring quite quickly. So I'm going to just show you some examples. First of all, let me uh, make sure I've got so many slides ready. I've got to make sure that I show you the right ones. Um, so let me switch over to my screen grab here. So here you can probably see these are the these are actually a number of different composition rules. The ones that I'm talking or the one that I'm talking about first is this one right here. So um, this one is where you divide it up. You put two lines down that way, two lines down this way, and then you try and get your subject to stick to one of these cross sections here. Um, some examples of the rules of thirds. Here we go. Um, this is just chopped up sort of, you've got the horizon, if you like, in one of the sections of the thirds. And it doesn't have to be in landscape orientation, as I'll show you in a minute. This one, I haven't put the subject in the any of the cross sections, but you kind of get the idea. The frame is divided up. If I had it divided up just dead in the center, which a lot of people do, it would look slightly less interesting. Um, here is another example. This is actually just a stock image. I quite often find fantastic stock images by photographers on a website called Pexels. Um, so I didn't individually note down the names of all the photographers. But if you imagine that grid divided up over here, then you can find that actually the pier is in one of those cross sections um, of the frame. Here is another example for example, of the rule of thirds. So if you imagine the grid over here, this guy hanging um, rather precariously over this ledge would sit roughly in one of the little cross sections of that grid. Um, and again, another landscape shot, nothing particularly of interest in the cross sections, but just the way that the picture's been divided up really does abide by the rule of thirds because the lavender field is in the bottom third and then obviously the sky is in the top two thirds and it really dominates the majority of this frame. So that gives you some examples of how you can use the rule of thirds and how um, you can kind of stick to that and actually find that for a lot of things it works really, really nicely. So the other one that I wanted to talk to you about, apart from the rule of thirds, is the is the second one. Um, this is known often as the golden ratio or the Fibonacci spiral. Now, um, Leonardo Fibonacci was an Italian mathematician and he discovered that in nature, uh, a lot of what we see and what we observe and in leaf patterns and animals and everything could be divided up into ratios of uh, 1 to 1.618. And don't expect you to remember that number, but essentially this is what we call a Fibonacci um, grid here with all these rectangles. And the Fibonacci spiral, which is this thing here, um, actually, if you use it in photography, it forces you to lead your eye from the outside of the frame and wind up at a point here where it concentrates. So the spiral has been drawn into the Fibonacci grid. Um, I have a simple version of it, which I will find. Here we go. So this is a simple version. This is a PNG, which people can then um, just kind of overlay on their pictures to see if it works. Um, and then this is a more complex example with the actual grid laid underneath um, and so, and you can put it on its side you don't have to have it in landscape orientation you can actually have this in portrait you can have it upside down it works in a number of different ways um, and I have downloaded um, a, a bunch of examples uh, from that now I have uh, just before I um, spoil it all and show you all of my examples at once I have gone through this morning the drive folder <laughs> <laughs> and, and last night at great length I have been looking at your pictures um, and they are fantastic there are so many brilliant examples here of both the rule of thirds and the Fibonacci spiral the golden rule as it's sometimes called it rolls off the tongue a little bit better um, and also some of the other things that I'm going to talk about in a moment so all of that if you want to afterwards go through your own photos or go through some of the pictures in the drive folder please do um, they are superb and there were a number of examples so I have stolen a bunch of those from 
from all of you that I want to share this afternoon as a kind of cross-section example of how you can put these rules to use, but also how you can break these rules because you don't need to actually apply them all the time in order to get a good photo. It just helps to know them so that you know if something's a little bit off in your photos, what you can do to very quickly uh, handle that. So when it comes to the Fibonacci spiral, as I say, you can have it in this orientation, you can have it going like that, or you can have it in this orientation going like that, or you can have it upside down, or you can have it going this way round. So there's a number of different ways that you can use it. Um, there are, if you, I, I have the PNGs and I can put those in the drive folder if that's helpful. If you want to use that to overlay in your on your images in Photoshop. I did find out while I was doing my research that in Photoshop you can actually, um, particularly in Photoshop CS6 um, as we're on, no, CS6 and Creative Cloud, that you can overlay your grid with the Fibonacci spiral or the golden rule, uh, golden ratio spiral, um, or one of those grids already. You can actually do that. So if you are editing your pictures and cropping, um, then when you look at the grid options, you've got an option to add those anyway. I didn't know that. I know that now. Um, yeah, Nilo's just found, <laughs> just telling me, yes, you have all of them. Um, so you can actually put overlay those on your images if you wanna make sure that your picture then crops to one of those um, special ratios. Now, as Nick pointed out, you can bring up the rule, the, the thirds grid, you can bring that up in many of the DSLRs, you've got the option to have the grid in your viewfinder, actually, as well as in the Zs. Um, if you're in live view, you can also do that as well. So if you are composing a landscape or something like that, Nick has is also helping me out with some of the fisheye images and uh, most of his images abided by all of these rules. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, there's so many brilliant examples. So you see some of those in a moment. Um, but yes, you can bring the grid up. If you don't know how to do that, if you've got an older camera, it's in the setup menu. Um, I believe cameras as early as the sort of D200, D300, the, the viewfinder grid display was in the setup menu. With newer cameras, it's actually in the custom settings menu under shooting slash display, usually. So um, it's, it's slightly different from one body to another, but that's where you find it if you wanna bring the grid up. If you're using a camera with live view, um, then you just have to, I don't actually, my D850 is downstairs right now because I was in the middle of shooting something earlier. Um, but if you do have a camera with live view and you have, this is a Z, it won't work on this, <laughs> but you have, um, one of those buttons that says info on the back of your camera. As you push it while in live view, it will give you different displays on the back. So you'll see different amounts of information. Um, you'll see the settings and then you'll see the histogram and then you will see the grid display. So if you are shooting with a DSLR that has that option, then just press that info button and you'll get your grid display up. It would be kind of cool if they added the, the golden ratio to it because I think that actually in a lot of cases, particularly when I was going through all of your images, and the stock images, I found so many different examples that used the Fibonacci spiral without actually maybe realizing that people were doing it. So um, so it's pretty cool. I am going to show you with my, let me just make sure I've got the right thing up. Uh, bear with me one moment, sorry, because I've got so many different sets of slides up. I just need to make sure that I've got the right one. Uh, <laughs> It's a fascinating topic here. Uh, here we go. So the Fibonacci spiral. Sorry, I just wanted to make sure that I actually showed you the right thing because, because I have so many slides to go through today. So here is one by Brian Leeming, who is one of our regulars. And as you can see now, intentionally, not, I love this. This is actually also a use of something I'm going to talk about a little bit later in terms of minimalism. But just the way that the spiral would work, this little um, piece of architecture, I'm guessing it is, or maybe it's modern art, I'm not sure, um, but it would fit perfectly in that. So the main concentration of the image is there. That's um, a very clear example. There is one here by David Webb, which is also a very haunting um, image that he took. Now, actually, the um, what do we call them? <laughs> 
<laughs> I've had a real problem with my vocabulary the last couple of days trying to find words. It's either a beef eater or a Gurkha, and I can't remember which one's which, and I'm British and I should know. But this um, rather sinister looking gentleman, very serious, um, is right in the main cross section, if you like, of the Fibonacci uh, spiral. If you have a look at this little thumbnail over here, um, then depending on which way around you put the spiral, he would fall pretty much in that section. This next one is possibly a less conventional example. This one is by William Gracia, and he took some fantastic wildlife images. There's a whole folder of them, so I do recommend looking through them, um, as there are with most people. Now, this one is, it kind of violates the rule a little bit because you would think that, actually, if you put the spiral over this image, you would expect it to go somewhere over the frog. It doesn't. It actually hovers somewhere over the little bee here, which is what partially what makes this in image so interesting is that it's, it's almost like two images in one. You've got the tree frog there, but you've also got this, I'm guessing it's some kind of wasp or worker bee. Um, and this actually ends up drawing the eye in more than the frog does. If they were two separate pictures, then you could have, you know, loads of negative space and then the bee, uh, or you could have loads of negative space and then the tree frog. But actually the two together works really nicely. So that is a very, very interesting way of using the spiral. Um, but these other pictures are very good examples of it because the spiral does pretty much fall exactly um, where these subjects are. Now there's a there's a bunch of ways to use this um, in portraiture as well in terms of I didn't have that many head-on portraits and I actually wanted to use the portraits for another example of composition so I've got them coming later but if you imagine a person's face the Fibonacci spiral if you put it in portrait orientation usually you'll have the closest eye somewhere in this section if you are doing a sort of like a headshot or anything like that. Um, so now the other grid which I've since closed which is slightly annoying let me find it one moment let me switch over so that you see me instead of me tottering around on my computer screen um, <laughs> I have to apologize for the amount of the amount of preparation I've done for this and then having to um, dig around and find things is slightly painful but here we go so the other grid that I wanted to show you which I will show you now here we go is another version of the Fibonacci ratio, which is this one here. So it may look slightly dissimilar, but essentially you've got the ratio of one to 0.618. That is what this is. So the, the ratio of one to one, which we normally get with these one to one to one, or this one where you've got a square grid. This is more useful if you're shooting for Instagram or square images, to be honest, because you do end up filling the frame and putting your main subject smack bang in the center. If you are using the Fibonacci principle, then you would usually put your subject a little bit further in. And you can see, if you compare this grid with this one over here, how much uh, difference there is. It's a slight difference to where the subject goes versus in your rule of thirds, but it does make all the difference when you are putting your subjects in these areas here. Um, so as I say, it's a slight alteration or variation from the spiral. I personally find the spiral more workable, but if you are doing landscape, um, you may find that actually this grid is more useful than this grid. So if you're cropping for post-processing in, in Affinity Photo, as someone mentioned, um, or in Photoshop, then you can lay over those grids on your images um, and then just see where the subject falls in the cross sections there so that you make sure you've kind of tweaked the image. It may just be a slight tweak just to move the elements of the main elements of your image ever so slightly to the left or the right or to make sure it fills one of those cross sections. But because, because Fibonacci discovered it as a mathematical phenomenon in nature, our eyes apparently, and I kind of see this from all the examples that I've been looking at, but our eyes find it more pleasing than something as clinical as the rule of thirds. So hopefully you're all tracking with me there, but essentially what I'm saying is you can use either or, um, but you may find that the Fibonacci principle or the golden ratio principle is more useful and more pleasing um, aesthetically than, for example, the rule of thirds, which we tend to learn as a basic and then sometimes find that it gets a little bit boring or a little bit too generic um, before too long. So try them both and play with them. Now there's a couple of other principles that I wanna go over 
in terms of composition before I switch over to talking about fisheye lenses. Some of these you will know. Um, in fact, most of them you will probably know. They are common sense. But if you are ever getting stuck with your pictures or you're feeling like you're maybe stagnating a little bit, because I certainly find that particularly now when we are stuck indoors um, and, you know, our, some of us can't leave the house at all. Others can only leave the house in a very limited amount. You may find that you're taking, taking the same pictures over and over and over again and you think what can I what can I mix up how do I change this so that it actually um, looks better or looks more pleasing um, so a couple of things and I do have examples for all of these um, the first one is filling the frame now there is um, the, it kind of ties in with the second one which is watching out what's in your background but essentially sometimes Filling the frame with your subject will look more pleasing than, for example, taking a picture. A flower is a very good example because quite often people take pictures of flowers and they wonder why they don't look so good or so pleasant. Um, if you actually fill the frame with the flower, it gives you a very different dynamic to having a picture of a flower with a whole bunch of foliage in a very busy background. So those two principles kind of go hand in hand, both filling the frame with your subject and also watching out what's in your background. Now, watching out what's in your background also ties in with portraiture and the simple principle of making sure you don't have things going through the back of people's heads, um, making sure that your background is uncluttered, for example, so that you really isolate the subject. Um, and also using your depth of field. So if you've got a wide aperture lens, then you know making sure that you open up that aperture a little bit to isolate the subject from the background. Or if you don't have a super wide aperture lens, the quick way to get around isolating your subject from the background is just to get closer to your subject and to bring your subject away from the background because then that will force your lens, even if you don't have a 1.4 aperture or something, it will still force your lens to create a shallower depth of field than if you've got a person standing against a brick wall and you're, you know, five meters away everything's going to look very flat. If you bring that person a few meters away from the wall and you get closer to the subject, the wall is going to blur out and the subject is going to be in focus. So you're isolating your subject from the background. All of my demonstrations are done by my hands. So I'm now going to show you, I'm now going to show you some examples. So let's go for filling the frame. Let me switch over to my screen grab. Here we go. I need to work out some shortcuts, I think, for this because otherwise I'm clicking everywhere. So John Hughes took this wonderful photo. This is very much filling the frame with the subject. This is also a fantastic use of negative space um, and of not having the objects passing through people's heads. It's actually a very, um, a very beautiful silhouette that he's used here. But this is filling the frame with the subject's face. Lubomir also took a wonderful photo here. This is also a lovely portrait. Again, filling the frame. Now, there is sometimes a little bit of contra controversy, I would say, about whether or not you should crop in and chop things off. And it depends what the subject is. So for example, I have somewhere, uh, somewhere not here, <laughs> I have in one of my folders, a great picture, I will find it for you. Let me go through, it's all a bit of a mess, but I will find it. Um, a picture where the subject is cropped, but it's so intentional and it really adds to the the beauty of the picture. Whereas with this one, for example, the top of the lady's head is slightly cropped and obviously it's a headshot, but it doesn't detract from the image. Um, if you had, for example, where you chopped off too much of her head, then yes, it would look less pleasing, let's say. Um, but actually filling the frame with a portrait works really, really nicely. Um, now, let me switch over to, sorry, just so that you don't have to look at me digging around inside my folders here. <laughs> here we go. Let's switch over that one and then switch over that one. So this one is obviously a very aggressive crop of a cat and you think well the picture could have been of the cat's half a face or whatever but actually the subject of the picture is the eye and so the photographer has gone super super close and done a huge amount of cropping sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't for example if you're taking a picture of um let's say i i do this with my rabbits a lot <laughs> i take a picture of the rabbits and the tops of their ears are chopped off um and it just doesn't work for a picture 
But if you were taking, a say, a cross section and you wanted the detail of the face and the eye and then the ear, as long as you've got it all in the frame, it would actually work quite well. Um, so getting in close and also making sure that you don't chop off anything that will detract from the image is very helpful. The same thing applies to plants and flowers for those of you who are doing any macro photography. Sometimes you need to get super close, but if you chop off too much detail um, or too much of the surrounding uh, subject, then you end up uh, with things a little bit out of context, let's say. So providing some context does help in your images. Now, I've already talked about not having objects passing through people's heads and how you can use depth of field to handle that. Um, another thing that you can do is using lead lines. And I do really enjoy using lead lines and pictures. And I've got some absolutely fantastic examples here. So um, lead lines are essentially where you get the person to train their eye to go into the frame. So this is a picture by Brian Leeming. He is a regular uh, contributor here. And um, as you can see in this image, the eye gets brought all the way to the end of the photo. So whether or not you pop the Fibonacci spiral over there and then you actually find that this cluster of people um, are in the cross section of that spiral or whether or not you use the rule of thirds. I mean, rule of thirds, you'd probably find that they're in approximately the same place. It does tie in that way sometimes. But the main thing that I admire about this image is that the, the eye is really brought all the way through the frame from the front to the end. Here's some other examples. Um, this is shot on film, obviously, and you've got these um, electricity poles, which are hideous things, really. But the wires make for some very interesting, they really do bring the eye into the frame a little bit. Um, again, this is also shot on film, but you can see just this little stream here is enough to bring, it could have been a slightly more boring photo, could have just been a picture of some apple blossom, but with the slight lead lines going through the bottom there, it actually brings the eye into the center of the picture. So that's quite interesting. Another um, excellent example, this is Nick Harrison. Um, so Nick here has used a combination of things. One is lead lines, the other one is framing. And that I'm gonna talk about again in a minute, but the lead lines here are the pavement. And then interestingly enough, these little portals of light, if you like, also frame the image quite interestingly. This is also a fisheye image, so it ticks all of the boxes. <laughs> um, and then another one by Nick, which is also a fisheye image. Um, but again, just the way that you can use that, what they sometimes call the vanishing point in, um, in art um, or lead lines in architecture, it just brings the eye into the center of the image. And then at the end of the image, you've got this wonderful sort of stained glass window at the end there. Um, now, just quickly segueing into framing, here are some images where framing has been used. So you can frame your subject within the picture. I'm not talking about adding a frame in post-processing. I'm talking about using stuff inside your pictures to actually frame the subject. So here, for example, this is the back of a van and it frames the subject perfectly. This is um, also, I laid over the Fibonacci principle over here and oh, everything falls in perfectly with the Fibonacci uh, grid in this image, but also um, the way that the person has been framed by this, I would guess some kind of temple ruins and also this looks like a volcano, but could be a mountain in the background. It is a stock image. I don't have the photographer's name, but it is a beautiful image um, and very, very, a very good example of using framing um, in that. Now, this is another one by Brian, Brian Leeming. Now, the interesting thing about this one is that it both uses framing and patterns, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute, but also just the fact that the window is open is what makes this, it completely transforms the picture. Because if you had, if you looked at this picture and all of the windows were closed, it would be a nice picture, but it would perhaps not be as interesting. But the fact that the window is open and it kind of breaks up the image and it happens to be not smack bang in the center, but slightly off center um, in one of those cross sections um, is what makes this image so interesting. Now here is another example. This is framing and also the Fibonacci grid applies to this picture perfectly. Um, but again, it could be quite a boring image of a guy just randomly posing. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what he's doing there. He's about to set off for a jog or something. But the way that the um, shadow of the pillars on the building have actually created a sort of 
a frame around him makes the image much more interesting. Um, so that is some framing examples for you. Now, I'm just going to quickly, while I'm here, check the comments because I don't, I haven't checked the comments in ages because I've been talking so much. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the next thing. So here we go. Uh, yes, Affinity Photo and Photoshop and probably a few others I'm sure that I haven't used, use those grid lines. So thanks for that, Terry. Um, architecture in Edinburgh. Thanks, Brian. That's very helpful. Uh, Beef Eater, Yeoman Warden. Yes, honestly, I couldn't remember the name. Thank you, everybody, for that. That was terrible. I just went blank. You know, I spent about 15 minutes last night trying to find the word vigil. I was writing a chapter of something. <laughs> <laughs> and I just lost all vocabulary. I think it's lockdown doing it to me. I'm sure it is. Um, thank you <laughs> for for the contributions, both of you. Um, that is very, very kind. Thank you for the coffee fund contributions. Uh, here we go. All right. Yes, PC lens effect. Thank you, Andy. Yes. Yeah, so as I talked about the other day on the PC lenses, you can obviously use that for selective focus. So that's another way to kind of separate your subject from the background and be a little bit more um, de decisive, let's say, on what's in focus. Uh, David Bailey used cropping to... <laughs> <laughs> Good effect is David Bailey. I know David Bailey even. Um, that's, yeah, some of those shots are phenomenal and I'm really, really glad that I can share them. It, it was quite a lot of work going through all those images and I wanted to just share them all, but I thought we'd be here for hours if I do that. Um, and I won't have talked about fish eyes at all. Uh, lots of, yeah, so option for, it would be lovely if the Fibonacci spiral could be featured within the viewfinder. It was something I was saying earlier, Tadius, but you might just have missed it. Unfortunately, it's not an option, but you can uh, overlay it in the cropping options in Photoshop, which means that you can kind of, um, you can d do it afterwards, basically. You've taken your image. You kind of have to mentally, I mean, I've been looking at these grids for so long today that I kind of now automatically see them when I'm looking at images. So if you study that enough, then you can kind of get an eye for it. Um, but as I say, it's not everything. It's just it's just something that might help you to bring your pictures together um, if you feel like they're lacking in some way. Now, I've looked at all the comments. I think I'm all up to date now. So everybody's um, everybody's tracking and I'm just about tracking with what I'm saying. Um, so the other two things that I'm very fond of and that you may use anyway, but I'm going to mention them. One of them is repetition and patterns. I am a complete sucker for using repetition and patterns and trying to find patterns both in nature and in architecture, um, and we have some lovely examples here. So I'm going to dig those out now. So this is a shot I actually took on the Z50, but the thing that um, really struck me is the patterns of this building. It's a block of flats and it's in, it's in Pimlico. Some of you might have walked past it if you've gone to the shop, um, but it just, just the repetition in it is what makes it so pleasing. And then yes, it gets broken up by the by the pigeons flying overhead. Here is another example from Nick. This is a lovely example, both of framing and patterns, I would say, because you've got both here. He's using the um, the pergola, is that how you pronounce it? Um, to And the lattice work to kind of frame this image. Now, an interesting thing about fish eyes, which a few people have mentioned to me, is that you have to be very careful about what's <laughs> <laughs> what's in it so this is it obviously intentional there are people in these photos and that's completely fine but i have seen a few fisheye images with people with the photographer's feet in the image so you have to be a little bit cautious with that but this is a, a fantastic example of both patterns and framing um the one that i see used a lot is people taking pictures of colored pencils that is another version of um, patterns, I would say, and also repetition. This one's slightly less conventional. This is another one that I took on the Z50, but it's just the the fact that you've got these alternating colors in some kind of semblance of liner and also just the, the parquet flooring on the, on the bottom there. It creates this kind of quite pleasing looking modern picture. Um, this is another one, a fantastic looking building and architecture is is brilliant for this kind of stuff because you find patterns everywhere and architects obviously work very, very hard to create these pleasing lines. Um, the last thing that I wanna talk about is negative space. I'm also a big, big fan of negative space and using it. And sometimes, sometimes negative space is all you need in order to kind of make or break the image. This is a picture I took back when I was testing the 300 PF, would you believe? And I was in Oxford Circus at the time. Um, and although 
you know, a lot of people probably think this is a really boring picture. <laughs> So I don't blame you if you do. Um, but I just, I really enjoy the fact that there is complete blue sky with no dirt on my sensor. That's very satisfying. Um, but also just the position of the horse just happened, this little balloon that I happened to spot miles and miles away. Well, I was shooting with a D750 at the time. Um, but just the amount of negative space with that one little topic, you know, in, in the center, one tiny subject is very, very pleasing. This is another really good example of the use of negative space. You could think, you could think that this picture is unfinished when you look at it. You could think, well, he's missing half of the, you know, of the Ferris wheel or the, actually, yeah, it is a Ferris wheel of some form. But actually, because you've got the subject, if you lay over the Fibonacci spiral here, these seagulls fall pretty much smack bang in the Fibonacci spiral. And then also this, um, the, the little Ferris wheel here actually works quite nicely in the top grid of the Fibonacci spiral. So um, the whole image just really works with the negative space. This is um, a lovely image by Paul Addison. Um, please do have a look at Paul's images in the drive folder. So many of them are perfect examples of the use of negative space. And although a lot of people will say, oh, well that's violating the rules of thirds. <laughs> It is, but it just works because of the negative space. Um, and it's the kind of picture that you could blow up massive. I think that if you go in for very modern looking decor, you could print a picture like this, you know, floor to ceiling size, and it would just produce a kind of sense of balance and calm. Um, this is another one by William Grissier, that who's uploaded a ton of wildlife images there. Now, the thing, Again, this is a kind of breaking the rules shot because, you know, it doesn't fall within the spiral. The, the snake head doesn't particularly fall within the rule of thirds or anything like that. But because of the quantity of negative space in the picture, it really isolates the snake. If you had a very busy background full of leaves and trees and stuff like that, this picture probably wouldn't work. But because you, you are missing all of that stuff and he's actually isolated the snake from the background, it just really, really works. So um, those are some examples for you. And I am sure there are loads. There are so many in the drive folder and also um, in a few other places. And a lot of people send me sample images and I really have a tough time picking out pictures because I go, oh, they're so good. What are, who, am I gonna, who am I gonna showcase today, you know? So, so that is pretty much everything. So just to recap on that before I switch over to talking about fisheye lenses. Um, so we've got the rule of thirds, the golden ratio, Fibonacci spiral, the grid. Um, then we've got filling the frame, um, watching out for your background and also making sure that you're not chopping off any major parts or um, let's say storytelling elements of your subject. Um, not having objects passing through the back of people's heads or if you are going to, if you can't declutter your background, then using your aperture and also just controlling where the subject is to remove the subject from the background a little bit so that you can blur it out. Um, or using a perspective control lens, as Andy was saying. Um, using lead lines uh, and framing and or framing both work in order to draw the person's eye into the photo so that it kind of tells a story. It makes the person's eye really travel into the picture. Um, and also repetition and patterns, whether that be black and white or color. Uh, and lastly, negative space. So those are some, I hope you're all taking notes because <laughs> that's a lot of things to remember. Um, but hopefully with those examples, you've kind of seen enough, um, just you've gotten enough reality on, on what those differences are between a kind of a good photo and a great photo um, that you might be able to just re-look at your pictures and perhaps crop them a little bit or, you know, focus on one element or go out and take some new photos and kind of, apply some of these principles um here we go so problem with fish eyes uh yes no so <laughs> i'm just gonna i only kind of half understand andy's comment so i'm gonna now just move over to the subject of fish eye lenses so the reason that i kind of wanted to combine these topics is because fish eye lenses um are quite a fascinating thing a lot of people think they're a bit of a one-trick pony and that you can only use them for a certain type of picture. But actually, I'm gonna show you, and I got sent so many examples from various different people um, that I actually really struggled to pick out some pictures to show you 
today but I thought I'm gonna try and show you some I also wanted to just mention before I talk about the lenses themselves um, in Photoshop even in Photoshop elements in fact you can and you can create a fisheye effect in post-processing so if you have a picture that you think might work in a fisheye effect you can do it also if you've got a little camera um, th this is a d5100 for example when I used to have the d750 I use this sometimes if you've got a camera that's got um, the effects mode and you've got the retouching menu in there you can also apply the fisheye effect to your images in post-processing now this is my son's d5100 I did a few shots and applied the fisheye effect and to be honest the quality was not great I mean it could have been because the shots I was doing it on were pictures that he'd taken and I don't know if they were in focus <laughs> honestly didn't know I was looking at them I was thinking oh, I think that's a bit blurry but I don't know whether that was him or or what <laughs> what but you can apply the fisheye effect in post-processing the reason that I wanted to talk about the lenses is because well, there's quite a few fisheye lenses out there. One of the most popular ones at the moment and the newest one, a lot of people don't understand why Nikon brought out a, a zoom fisheye and what the kind of the big deal is. But um, the 8 to 15, if you're not familiar with it, is a fisheye zoom. At the 8 millimeter end, it produces a completely circular image, much like a couple of the images I showed you from Nick there. Um, and at the 15 end, it acts like a normal fisheye. Now, before the 8 to 15 came out, we had only really two options in terms of autofocus lenses. You've got the DX lens, which is a 10.5 fisheye, f2.8, and you've got the 16mm 2.8. Now, both of those, that's an FX lens. Now, both of those are still made and you can still buy them. The 8 to 15 is very different. Um, and I'm just going to pull out my notes because Simon Stafford and I had a long conversation about this um, over, over the last couple of days. Um, as to why you would use one over the other um, and how you can use fisheye lenses for various different things. Um, Simon, Simon's comment was that the 80, he's got, he's got a lot of fisheye lenses. He's got the 8 to 15, he's got the 10.5 and he's got the 16 mil. Um, and he said, why do I have so many? I'm not entirely sure. But the 8 to 15, in his opinion, and from what I've, the little tests that I've done with it, um, optically is the best and of course is the most flexible because you can do quite a lot with it. And I'm gonna show you some of Nick's images. I'm gonna show you some of Simon's images and some comparisons and a couple from another gentleman called Simon Newman. I don't know if Simon's actually joining us today, but um, he often sends me pictures and he takes some very interesting pictures with them, um, with that lens. So I thought I would share those. Um, a point to note on the 8 to 15, and I really wish I had one in my hands to show you, but the lens hood that comes with it can only be used at the 15 mil end. The 8 to 15 has a bulbous front element, so it protrudes like the 1424, for example. Um, and unfortunately, that means that when you put a lens hood on, you actually see it in the frame. Um, if you're using it at 15 mil, then you don't see it. That's the only, even at 14 mil, you can see it. Um, another benefit of the 8 to 15 is that it um, has a, I think the word is high resistance to flare, that's probably the words I'm looking for, which means that even if you've got a light source at the edge of the frame or in the frame, you don't get a huge starburst or um, you don't get lots of flare coming off that source of light. And the main reason for that is that it's nano crystal coated. I don't believe that the 60 mil fisheye is, it's a little bit too old for that. Although someone might correct me now and say, yes, it's got the N written on it. But anyway, um, I haven't I haven't forgotten. Um, in fact, I've got a note <laughs> before someone tells me I've forgotten something. I haven't, honest. Um, okay, so the 10.5 fisheye, I used to have one um, and I sold it, which I'm quite regretful um, of, unfortunately. But I don't use DX cameras generally. You can use it on a full frame camera and it will crop. Another thing that someone did, um, which I found kind of scary, they brought me a 10.5 fisheye, and if you've seen these lenses, they have this um, built-in kind of tulip lens hood. Someone had massacred the lens and had actually shaved off the tulip lens hood, and I was, <laughs> I was like, why? Why did you do that to your lens? But actually, it meant that they could put it on a full-frame camera, because when you put that 10.5 on a full-frame camera, although you automatically get the DX crop mode. If you turn it off, you can see the petal hood in the frame if you turn off the auto DX crop. And if you shave off the lens hood, and I'm not recommending that anybody does that, I just, this is curiosa more than anything else, um, then you actually get an almost completely circular image. It's not a full circular image, but it is an interesting um, 
way to use a 10.5 on a full frame camera if you wanted to be so daring as to shave off the uh, the metal lens hood. Don't try this at home, please. Um, now, the only focal lengths that produce a full circular image, as Andy was going to point out to me, um, is the 8mm and also the 6mm. <laughs> so those produce a completely circular image. Um, and we have one of those, not the 6mm at the moment, we have the 8mm in the shop and it is a phenomenal looking lens. So that does produce that fully circular image. Um, one thing that a lot of people don't, I suppose, think about with fisheye lenses is that actually the closer you get to the subject, the more exaggerated the fisheye effect is, but also they they focus incredibly close. So the 8 to 15 focuses as close as 16 centimetres, so like no, 16 centimetres, very close, and the uh, others are all between 25 and 30 centimetres, so maybe, you know, just under a foot, which is very, very impressive because you can then use it for not only architecture and interiors and, you know, those kind of funky lens effects that you might want there, um, but also for kind of subject isolation and throwing the rest of the subject completely out of focus. Um, I am going to show you some examples. I think I'm first going to show you the examples from Simon. So let me pull up that folder because he sent me a whole sequence of shots. Um, thanks, Al, for pointing out the 1424. Yes, that one also uh, has a bulbous front element. So let's see if it will open it up for me in sequence. Um, I'm sorry, I sound like I'd, I'm completely untechnically proficient when I do this. It's not that. It's actually just that I want to make sure my computer behaves and does what it's supposed to do. So let's switch over my screen. So. Simon took a sequence of shots and I'm going to just talk you through them um, one after the other. Let's have a full screen here. Okay, so this is with the 14 to 24 at 15 millimeters. So we've got a bit of comparison because Simon and I were thinking, how do we best show the fisheye effect? How do we show the difference between that and another wide angle lens? Um, well, he has the 14 24 and he's also got the 8 to 15. So we're going to go through it that way. So that is the 14 to 24 at 15 millimeters. Now this is the 8 to 15 at 15 millimeters. And you'll notice if I just flip between those two very quickly, you actually get a wider field of view with the 8 to 15 because it covers 180 degrees, which is a considerable amount. So 14, 24, and there you go. 8 to 15 at 15 millimeter. Now, the next one, as you can see, is the, the lens hood. That's what happens when you put the lens hood on the 8 to 15 um, and, and you shoot at anything except for 15 millimeters. So essentially, this kind of, uh, with the, this is the 8 to 15 with the detachable lens hood removed. I'm just trying to read his notes here. So the image circle no longer covers the full frame range. Now, if I switch, so this is 11 millimeters. This is eight millimeters. You see that difference? So let's just go through those again. So that's 15 millimeters, 11 millimeters, and eight millimeters. What an incredible difference between those. Now, um, one thing that a couple of people ask me, and I will just point out here, these lenses do produce a considerable amount of fringing. So if you have a look around here, you'll see this blue fringing. It is normal for fisheye lenses to do that. And some of them do it more than others, but particularly those that produce this circular image, they do fringe a lot right at the edge. Um, and it's just a known thing, unfortunately. So again, this is the uh, 1424. This is at 15 millimeter. This is with, but rather than having the uh, sort of landscape angle, we're concentrating on something which is much closer. Now, if you have a look at the eight to 15 with the 15 millimeter angle of view, you see the difference there. That's, so the fisheye effect is less obvious actually than the sort of what you call the distortion on the 1424. Um, but also because of the wider field of view, you get more in. Um, and then again, we've got the 1424 at 15 millimeters. And then we've got the 8 to 15 at 15 millimeters. And then you get that exaggerated kind of fisheye bowing effect, if you like, down the bottom there. Another point worth noticing, the closer to the subject 
you you get, particularly in architecture, it's more noticeable, the more the distortion is is obvious. If you're quite far away, as with those first shots, you notice that the distortion isn't actually as visible as it is when you're very, very close. Um, okay, so here is another one. This is with the 14 to, nope. <laughs> Which one is this? There we go. So that is with the, bear with me, number nine. There we go, that's with the 1424 at 15 millimeters. He numbered them all for me. So I had to make sure that I got it right. Um, so 1424 at 15 millimeters, and then again, eight to 15 at 15 millimeters. So huge amount of distortion because it's very, very close to the subject, but also much wider, wider field of view. Now I'm gonna move on to the DX shot. So 10.5 DX is less exaggerated um, than with the, uh, with the 8 to 15, I find personally. So the 10.5 obviously is a fixed lens. 10.5, you can barely see the fisheye effect. With the 8 to 15, uh, 8 millimeter or thereabouts, it's pretty exaggerated. This is with the um, 11 mil millimeter end of the 8 to 15, and you do get, if I just skip through that one, you get a slightly different field of view. The 10.5, let's just, if you have a look at these houses over here and these trees over here, and then have a look at the 11 millimeter, you've actually chopped off a little bit. So the 10.5 gives you a slightly wider field of view. It's very interesting. And then again, this is the 18, 8 to 15 at 12 millimeter, at 14 millimeter, and at 15 millimeter. And basically, the further away your subject is, the less exaggerated that fisheye effect is. So those are just some um, examples for you so that you can see some uses for the 8 to 15 lens. I know it's a little bit didactic to go through every single picture, but I just wanted you to see all of the differences and how you can use a fisheye, not just for some quirky shots, but also for general architecture if you don't have um, an option. Now, uh, let's just see. For doo -doo -doo, I just want to make sure I'm covering all the comments before I chat about the next bit. Yeah, so also just as Terry said about distortion, um, on wide angle zooms, you will get distortion. Just like those pictures that I showed from Simon um, of the 1424, you do end up getting distortion and it does depend on where your subject is in the frame. The closer the subject is to you, even with a non fisheye lens, you will get some barrel distortion because of course lenses are circular um, and the lens elements are, are slightly domed, let's say, even it, within the lens itself. So hence Nikon talk about a spherical elements and various different things to help handle that but you do end up with a bit of distortion particularly if your subject's quite close um now one thing that simon mentioned is if you keep your subject level to the um to the camera <laughs> that's the word i'm looking for oh my goodness it's nearly an hour already and I'm, I'm completely running out of words so if you keep your camera level with the subject then you will get less linear distortion than if you, for example, are pointing up or downwards. So um, I'm gonna show you some examples that Nick has taken and also um, Simon Newman has taken um, using the eight to 15 and some different uses for it. Just as a little note of what Simon Staff had suggested, he said of his lenses, the eight to 15 is the most versatile for sure. If you're using DX cameras, he would generally recommend the 10.5, but just because the 10.5 does give you slightly better performance on a DX camera. So just to um, to to give you that little bit of feedback from him. I mean, with, when it comes to Simon Staffer's reviews, he is always completely honest and very factual about what he believes is the right thing. And I, I completely agree with his kind of conclusion on the eight to 15. Definitely in terms of the images that I've shot on fisheye in the past, I've never been super pleased with them, but actually the eight to 15 is quite incredible. Um, yes, if you want no distortion, then ha get the get a tilt shift lens, get the 19 mil. It is the best, I would say, um, for sure, in terms of no distortion. If that's what you need, if you need zero distortion in camera, then the 19 mil PCE, as, um, as Taipei Geek said, is the right one to use. All right, so I'm gonna show you these examples. I'm just gonna pull them up before I flip my screen over again because I um, am that prepared. <laughs> so I'm gonna show you first the uh, ones just to give you some different examples using the 10.5. Let's just flip over here. I also changed my desk over the weekend and I need a mouse mat because my mouse doesn't move properly. Um, this is taken with a 10.5 fisheye on a D200, what feels like half a century ago, but this was just a shot that I took um, 
when I was playing around with it for the first time. And the fact that you could get super close to the subject and then get all that amazing distortion was, was a lot of fun. This is the Nikon DF. This is with the 16 mil, actually the AI, 3.5 AI, which is a lovely lens. Um, and it just, I couldn't get a lens that would fit the whole building in, but the 16 mil just about did it. Um, now here is a lovely example. This is from Simon Newman, and this is an example of lying down in the bluebells and shooting upwards with the eight to 15 and that fully circular image that you get there. And then here is another one. This is, I believe also Simon. Yes, this is Simon Newman. Um, and again, this is kind of just, it's just an interesting use of the eight to 15 lens. Um, Simon does a lot of pictures of uh, Winchester Cathedral. Um, there are some stunning images that he sent over. I'm going to ask him to put them in the drive folder of the roof of this cathedral. I mean, it is quite a spectacle, but this just gives you one example of how you can use it. Um, I then wanted to just show you, oh, let me show you another one. This is another one of Winchester Cathedral. So this just gives you an idea of the different uses for it. I can see people commenting very busily in the background. I will get to you in just a moment. Um, I now wanted to just show you this is so Nick very kindly uploaded quite a large selection of images uh, to the drive folder and I really struggled to just pick out one or two. So <laughs> I'm gonna ask you to go through these when we're done. Um, but there were just some really super examples um, of framing and also using, I mean, I showed you some in the, in the composition um, segment of the stream, but I just wanted to talk about how you can use it for different things. Yes, there's um, these wonderful images here of, I don't know what this place is, but I feel like I should go there. It's gorgeous. Um, it's like a church come library. I'm not sure. Anyway, Nick will probably tell me in a minute. Um, but just the, the way that you can use these lenses for things that maybe you wouldn't necessarily think of using them for. So apart from ceilings and architecture, but also using them for nature and things like that around cathedral. There we go. Um, I'm not going to show you them all because there are a lot of them, but I do want you to, if you get a moment, go through them. But also just the way that you can, um, this is a good example because it's landscape. And because Nick also used framing with some railings here, which was quite interesting. This is off, off a bridge, I'm guessing. Um, but you can use it for a number of things. So it's not, it's not just a one trick pony, as they say, or one trick horse. I thought that those were a fantastic example. I am hoping that you will all get a chance. It's in the drive folder. Um, Nick Fisheye is the name of the folder, so please do go through those, but also go through each other's pictures because there are so many brilliant examples of composition um, and how you can um, you know, use those composition tips that I gave you earlier to actually just readjust your photography a little bit and maybe you know reset your thinking when you go out with your camera. Um, I'm going to just answer the question about the Zs and the adapters. So quick answer. Yes, you can use, as Simon has said, hi Simon, um, as Simon has said, you can use the 19 mil with the FTZ on the Z6 and Z7. You can use the fisheye lenses with the FTZ on the Z6 and Z7. I know of no restrictions for that. The only, um, I would say, stickler is that if you've got an older camera, sorry, I beg your pardon, an older lens like an AF, 16 mil or an AF 10.5 fisheye, then you will be stuck with not having autofocus on your Zs. That's the, the only caveat. Also, just because some people do have these smaller cameras, if you do have a little camera like a D5000 series or a 3000 series, the 10.5 fisheye lens is an AF, not an AFS lens. So it won't autofocus on these bodies. Most of the time that doesn't matter because a lot of the time when you're using fisheye lenses, you're shooting at infinity or you're shooting at the closest focusing distance. And the throw on those lenses is very, very small. So in terms of fine tuning your focus and things like that, you don't have to worry too much about that with the with the 10.5 fisheye. But if you do have one of those um, older lenses and you have a newer body or a Z, you won't get autofocus. So it's only the, ten, uh, the 8 to 15 AFS, which will give you autofocus on your Zs. Um, all right, let's just have a look and see if there's any other questions I didn't answer before I finish today. I hope you've all found this very helpful. <laughs> I'm sorry that my mouse doesn't click fast enough for me to open all the files. So, so if I've been a little bit stultified, it also I think my brain's not working and I need another cup of coffee. Um, <laughs> Speaking of, don't forget the coffee fund, it still exists. Um, so can you, yes, I've answered that one. Sorry, Colin, um, that you missed 
the the thing if you refresh sometimes if it's out of sync you might just need to refresh your page and then it will come up but you can catch up later hopefully it's not too out of sync for you um that's good to know nick i did not know that was the mercato i will have a look at that uh that seems to be everything i think i've answered all the questions hooray <laughs> Uh, good. All right. Well, that covers my Tuesday talk. I hope that you found that helpful. Thank you to everybody for tuning in um, and for all of your contributions on the comments. If I missed any, I'm sorry. I will go through them a little bit later just in case I missed anyone. Um, my wonderful partner in crime is going to put the link to the drive folder at the bottom so that you can check out pictures. Um, as I say, a lot of the pictures that I showed today were stock images just because it was very easy to pull those out um, of a website. But also, thank you to everybody who has been uploading pictures to the drive folder because um, it's it's actually just lovely to see so much, so much talent <laughs> in this little group that we have here. Um, so, and also thank you for being so kind to each other and putting, you know, nice comments on there and encouraging each other. Don't, <laughs> don't overdose on coffee. <laughs> Ah, uh, no, <laughs> don't you worry, I can, yes. <laughs> I can drink coffee at about seven o'clock at night and still sleep like a baby uh, or a log. So anyway, uh, so don't worry about that. <laughs> all right, I will see you all on Thursday. I am very much looking forward to Thursday's stream. I hope that um, I get everything ready in time for that one. Um, I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. We're gonna co cover all being well, fingers crossed, the subject of Flash. And if for any reason I don't pull it off in time for Thursday, I will find something else very useful to talk to you about. Um, Thank you all. I will see you on Thursday. Have a great rest of your day and a great Wednesday too. I'll see you then.